next talk is actually an old colleague of mine, Marston Kaspersek, who is a professor of finance at Imperial College in London. And he's a, a, a leading research in empirical finance. He is, the, he is the guy you'd really like to ask if you wanted to know whether climate was being priced because he has a way of uh, examining financial returns to, uh, to pull out little nuggets of information. And, and so we're very happy to have him do that. He's a, uh, a, a fellow of, uh, of the NBER, uh, an associate editor of the Review of Financial Studies. And uh, we're very, very happy to have you with us today. So let me turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Rob, uh, for this great introduction. I still remember all the time uh, from the New York uh, area and uh, great to be uh, back uh, at least uh, virtually and to talk about uh, some of the work I've been doing over the last couple of years. Uh, so I hope uh, the screen is now visible to everyone. So uh, what I want to talk about is uh, kind of connected to what uh, Johannes and uh, also Rob were uh, talking about uh, for the first uh, two presentations. I will try to uh, kind of uh, address this question of uh, carbon risk and uh, thinking how it is that investors in the markets that are potentially sensitive to this particular uh, risk uh, are actually pricing uh, any kind of potential uh, effects in the, uh, that are potentially happening. And uh, this is uh, based on the joint work that I've been doing uh, with a colleague of mine and a professor also at Columbia University uh, Patrick uh, Bolton. So, so this is uh, pretty much the abbreviated version of a, a few uh, papers we have done, and I encourage you to look maybe at my website at your free time uh, to see what else uh, in exact uh, detail we are actually doing there. So let me uh, motivate it uh, by uh, really looking at some of these facts that uh, both Johannes and uh, Rob were talking about, which is, uh, I think by now there is quite a lot of uh, strong evidence from science suggesting that uh, really the physical atmosphere is changing and uh, we need to start reckoning a little bit the potential consequences of, uh, uh, of the global warming. And, and I think uh, the consequence of that is quite important because what I think we realize is, is that there is some kind of relationship between what the economic side of the world is doing vis-a-vis -vis what is the sustainable uh, path of temperatures that we can actually endure if we want to survive as a society. And, and I think this uh, problem has been highlighted a number of times. Uh, Paris Agreement was clearly, the COP21 was clearly one of these uh, defining moments when we started talking about uh, that particular relationship. But what is kind of interesting is that uh, scientists have been revising uh, our uh, kind of expectations, what this uh, magic number should be pretty much downward. And at the moment, uh, what is the conclusion from this scientific evidence is that if we let uh, the temperature go up uh, by one and a half uh, degrees Celsius relative to the pre-industrial uh, level, that may actually be uh, dangerous to uh, human existence. And uh, what motivates a lot of what I and Patrick have been doing in uh, our uh, research is this kind of coordinated effort now to tackle this problem, to tackle this one and a half degree uh, Celsius increase by thinking about uh, commitments, uh, thinking about uh, the reduction in emissions, and this uh, picture I have uh, shown a number of times already to, in various presentations, but I think it's a really a great picture because what it really shows is uh, an essence of uh, how we maybe want uh, to uh, uh, think about this carbon risk. So what the picture shows is the projection of uh, what would be the different uh, paths of uh, global emissions worldwide and what implications uh, they would have uh, for the increase in the temperature. And the one that uh, kind of motivates a lot of uh, debate uh, these days is actually the one that shows that if we want to stay within one and a half uh, Celsius uh, uh, limit, we actually need to think about uh, the global emissions to uh, go down uh, to zero by roughly 2050, 2060. So this number has been uh, voiced by quite a few uh, people. Just uh, to tell you what it is quantitatively that we are talking about, we are talking about reducing uh, 420 gigatons of emissions worldwide effectively uh, to zero. If you wanted to think about the linear model that takes this type of uh, effort uh, to arrive at zero is 2050, 2060, the, the, the gradient of decline in emissions that we need to kind of uh, follow is equivalent to how much emissions we have reduced uh, through the COVID pandemic in the 2020. 
So given how much uh, sacrifice has been done on the economic front to actually experience uh, that type of rate of decline, that uh, kind of tells you how difficult the problem it is for the society to tackle. But nevertheless, uh, our starting point for financial implications of this is that really the society needs to go this way. And I think there is quite a lot of evidence that there would be a push uh, in this particular uh, direction coming from many different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in this uh, society. And as a consequence of that, uh, we need to understand that uh, going to so-called uh, uh, net neutrality or zero carbon emissions is going to generate some kind of a risky path uh, for players in this uh, market, and specifically for uh, companies and investors who actually allocate uh, capital to these uh, uh, companies. And this is an essence of uh, what uh, people have been uh, framing as a carbon transition risk. And uh, if you think about really what uh, the source of this risk is, there are two types of uncertainties that uh, we need to uh, think about, which is uh, the cost uh, at which these emissions are going to decline and whether they are going to actually decline at a fast enough uh, rate. And the second one is how is it that uh, an individual investor who is uh, allocating capital to these uh, firms is going to actually embrace this particular uh, change uh, over time. So any kind of uh, aversiveness to a uh, climate effect the things that Johannes talked about as well is going to be critical uh, for uh, thinking about pricing this particular uh, risk. So what is it that I want to talk about today? I want to uh, think a little bit about this problem from the empirical point of view and ask the question to what extent this idea of uh, transition risk, as I have uh, penciled it down, is actually already with us in asset prices. And uh, the question is going to be uh, very simple. We will want to think of some kind of uh, metrics of uh, capturing this particular phenomenon and try to see whether sorting companies on this type of metric is actually uh, producing some kind of meaningful variation in asset prices. And more interesting, this is going to be a global perspective. So I'm going to be looking at uh, a data that comes from more than 70 countries uh, globally, pretty much the main uh, producers of uh, emissions worldwide. And we will want to also understand to what extent we see some meaningful variation that is represented by these different uh, countries and maybe some kind of uh, micro-founded elements of this particular uh, variation. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, in a lot of debate these days, especially uh, that uh, practitioners and uh, media want to engage in, there is uh, a lot of talk of something that is called a carbon alpha uh, discussion. And uh, we too at least uh, want to caution that it's very hard to talk about something that is called carbon alpha without really having a model of uh, transition risk. So, so our goal is going to be a little bit more modest. We are not going to say whether assets are fairly priced or not. What we want to want, uh, understand is the relative pricing of these assets without really uh, telling much whether these are fair prices uh, or not. So in an essence, uh, what we are uh, kind of uh, capturing is this exposure or so-called uh, carbon uh, betas. So let me tell you how it is that we want to be thinking about it. And our approach is going to be very simple. I know to many it's going to sound too simple to, uh, to be meaningful, but uh, we believe that it actually has a solid motivation and it's this net neutrality. If we think about the path that requires companies to actually go towards zero emissions, the way how you want to think about the exposure of individual firms to this particular risk is actually thinking about how much they actually currently produce in terms of their emissions. So we are going to think about the total level of emissions of individual companies as a proxy for these exposures to transition risk. And we are going to think of this particular metric as being associated with some kind of longer term risk because we recognize the fact that emissions are not going to go to zero overnight, but nevertheless, the kind of pressure is to reduce them to zero by 2050 or so. And then we are going to contrast that with another measure, which is going to be an assessment on that path, which is to what extent the companies that are supposed to go towards carbon neutrality are actually moving in that direction. And that's going to be captured by the simple percentage change in emissions on an annual basis. So we'll want to understand what is the kind of uh, uncertainty or risk associated with this net neutrality. And can we exploit the variation in this uh, path uh, kind of uh, uh, dimension uh, to understand the riskiness of these companies? And what's interesting about these two measures, and I don't have the data to show it today in the interest of time, but just to mention that the correlation between those two measures is actually not very large. So in some sense, the two measures, in essence, are capturing slightly different uh, objects that may be of uh, economic uh, interest. 
And that's uh, kind of our focus. At the micro level, what I also want to stress out is the fact that we can kind of attribute the transition risk uh, to different uh, sources of that transition. Johannes alluded to it as well, but just briefly to, again to classify those, we can think that there is uncertainty that uh, kind of affects the cash flows of the firms. And that could be, for example, related to the degree of technological progress, how quickly and how costly the companies are going to be able to adapt the new technologies that are essential to reduce emissions. You can also think about uh, the tightness of policy environment. To what extent is this going to impose some kind of cost on the companies? How uh, expensive it is going to be for the firms? It's also the uncertainty about these policies, what matters for this cash flow resolution. But on the other hand, we're also going to have this risk premium effect, which are related to how is it that the investors and the stakeholders in these companies are actually viewing these adjustments. So you can think about some kind of political environment or socioeconomic environment as being relevant for thinking about these ideas. Thinking about the changes in aversion awareness is another way to think about this type of discount rate effects. So I will try to show a little bit evidence on uh, how much we can attribute uh, some of the results uh, to one uh, versus the other of these two effects. So let me briefly uh, summarize the data that uh, I will be uh, basing my results on today. So the data is gonna be uh, an interesting panel of uh, firm level emissions at uh, different levels of scope intensity. And uh, this data come uh, from a true cost, which is one of these uh, very, uh, uh, known companies producing this information. Recently, in fact, Trucos got acquired by uh, Standard & Poor's. And what Trucos does is a very meticulous uh, documentation of firm level emissions over time. They do it uh, from uh, 2005, and that's the data that uh, we have acquired. And they do it at a global level. So ultimately, what we are going to be looking at is a very large panel of data of more than 14,000 firms uh, coming from uh, all sectors, uh, industrial sectors, and from over 70 uh, countries. So just briefly to uh, note what it is that we are going to observe in the data, we are going to observe uh, information on uh, three different levels of uh, emission activity. The scope one activity, which are emissions at source, or so-called direct emissions, that's, uh, that's uh, directly related to how much uh, companies pollute uh, when they actually produce energy. And then we are going to uh, contrast it with indirect emissions, either coming from a cons a a consumption of energy, think about the steel factory requiring uh, energy produce uh, uh, the output, or from the value chain, which is this uh, scope theory emissions and very interesting ones and most difficult really to capture. So in the data that we are going to be talking about today, I'm going to be talking about scope free emissions that are captured in the upstream activities. But the hope is that we will be able at some point to also contrast those with the downstream activities. And the way how the uh, regulators and policymakers have been moving, uh, the scope free activities are actually gaining more and more prominence uh, in the uh, financial crowd. So let me tell you how it is that we are going to be uh, looking at this uh, value uh, differences. We are going to be looking at so called characteristic based models, uh, a la Daniel and Titman 1997 where we will try to explain the cross-sectional variation in stock returns across these uh, companies. And our uh, main uh, explanatory variable of these returns are going to be these uh, emission levels uh, observed on an annual level. So either uh, the levels or the uh, percentage changes, as I have highlighted. And as has been noted earlier uh, before, uh, uh, we are going to try to soak up as much of this additional variation that potentially correlates with emissions and affects stock returns. Uh, to the best uh, possible uh, ability. We're also going to uh, take advantage of various uh, fixed effects. So the time, country fixed effects, and importantly, the industry fixed effect is going to be one of these uh, controls that matters a great deal in the way how this uh, variation is going to be uh, captured. So let me show you the flagship results of this uh, exercise. So this is based on the unconditional sample of all the firms I have uh, defined. And we are looking at these uh, regressions with the level of emissions as the uh, right-hand side variable. These are uh, captured on the log scale. And uh, as I said, we are dividing it uh, according to three different levels of uh, scope uh, activity, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And the differences across the columns that you are uh, observing are largely the differences whether we include actually industry fixed effects or whether we actually include firm fixed effect as well. <laughs> 
So the first stark result that we observe in this data is this very strong positive relationship between uh, emission levels and stock returns in this cross section. They are uh, both economically and statistically uh, significant. In terms of economic significance, we are talking about two to 4% uh, return difference for the one standard deviation change in the scope uh, emission. So clearly a sizable effect uh, having very high uh, pricing uh, implications. Interestingly, if we look at this other measure of uh, transition risk, which is the short-term adjustment on the path captured by the percentage changes, we find a very similar effect. And if anything, the results are even more robust, which tells us that both of these kind of simultaneously matter, because uh, remember, they are not actually highly correlated with each other in the cross-section. What is actually interesting, and that's the result I want to kind of flag, because many people think in this particular way, is that if we consider the scope, uh, the emission intensity, a very popular metric that is oftentimes uh, used by uh, many people to define the transition risk, which is just emissions scaled by the revenue of the company, we do not find actually much of this relationship that we found in the previous two uh, metrics. And we actually try to put quite a strong uh, voice on that particular metric, arguing that uh, emission intensity in some sense is not compatible with this uh, net neutrality objective. It is clearly the case that companies reducing intensity may be actually reducing emissions at the same time, but we can also actually imagine companies that reduce intensity, but they grow their revenues actually at a higher rate than they are growing emissions, and as such, they are moving away from this net neutrality objective. And recently, this point has been actually voiced quite heavily by a lot of policymakers, where the push is to actually disclose total emissions rather than emission intensity, because people recognize that they potentially carry some noise in the way how we want to think about transition. So let me now uh, talk uh, in the last uh, five minutes or so about uh, some other interesting results that we found in this uh, uh, research that we are doing. So as I mentioned, one of the interesting questions is to what extent are these markets uh, pricing some kind of heterogeneous responses across different uh, economic environments? And this is to some extent a joint hypothesis. Uh, is there some kind of representative global investor who spans all these markets? Or maybe these markets for climate risk are actually uh, partially segmented. And what we found is evidence is probably consistent more with the latter rather than the former. We found that the carbon transition risk is indeed priced in all kind of geographic locations, but interestingly, it is priced with different magnitudes. Just to give you an idea, the magnitudes are generally larger for North America and Asia. They are smaller for, say, Europe or even more small for Southern Hemisphere countries that are listed here. What doesn't seem to matter also to kind of support this partial segmentation of the markets is that uh, companies being multinational are not actually witnessing a very different premium than uh, companies that are just uh, based within one uh, economic jurisdiction. So this is the first type of uh, interesting variation we observe. One of the interesting questions that people have debated, especially around the implementation of various uh, penalties on the emitters, was this idea of to what extent is this carbon risk a story of a developed countries and to what extent we should be punishing emerging markets in this particular regard. So naturally we would like to see, is there actually a variation in the way how economic uh, development interacts with these effects? And interestingly, we didn't find much of the difference in the way how financial markets price it. At least from the total level of emissions, whether you are part of the developed economic uh, uh, kind of region or not, doesn't seem to matter much for the size of this premium. In the short run, we do observe that the more developed countries are exposed uh, to a slightly smaller short-term transition risk, which of course could be consistent with the fact that they already covered some of this transition uh, towards the net uh, neutrality. So a couple of more things and uh, I will be done. So we look at this individual components of transition risk. We try to see to what extent is the transition risk associated with the uh, some kind of uncertainty about the technological uh, change, how much is it related with uh, policy and how much is it related with the political environment. So what we found, generally speaking, is that the uh, energy mix and political environment of the country are much more important for the short term transition risk. So countries which are more advanced in terms of their renewable production, in terms of their uh, actually uh, uh, kind of inclusiveness of these uh, uh, ideas, are actually pricing a relatively smaller transition risk. On the other hand, uh, these uh, elements of transition risk don't seem to matter much uh, for the long-term risk. 
which kind of suggests that maybe this uh, energy kind of transition is not something that financial markets price as a long-term phenomenon. On the other hand, what seems to matter for the long term is actually the policy environment. We had great measures in our uh, research uh, to actually capture how countries vary in terms of their domestic and international policies that they implement on companies. And what we found to our actually interest was that what matters more for uh, carbon transition risk is actually domestic policy, less so international agreements, which is kind of uh, consistent with the story of coordination costs that people talk about in the context of the carbon tax. So last, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the awareness to this. Uh, so we wanted to see to what extent we can use some kind of shocks uh, that uh, change people's awareness uh, about the climate risk. So of course, it's very hard to think of this kind of shocks with the global data that we are after. But nevertheless, we tried a couple of things. We look at the Paris Agreement as one of these uh, shocks that kind of increase the awareness of the uh, climate change. And what we found is that Paris Agreement largely has increased the exposure to this long-term transition risk. We also look at the investors' beliefs as captured by, say, country-level variation. And we found that actually exposure to Paris was greater for North American and Asian companies less so to Europe. So in some sense, Europe has already priced some of these effects prior to Paris. And finally, what we found is that the story is not really about just a handful of industries like energy, utilities, and transportation, but it's actually more of a deeper phenomenon that affects a, a wide range of economic activity. So maybe just in the last minute, I want to say as a kind of out of sample evidence what we have done, we have also found that if you actually imputed the data to the 90s, and try to actually see to what extent the cross-sectional variation that we use in the 21st century has some kind of pricing implications uh, prior to that, we actually do not find much evidence of, uh, of this uh, cross-sectional variation that I have shown today. So in some sense, it is consistent with the view that the story of the climate change is really the story of the 21st century. And last, uh, but maybe also interesting, what we found is that uh, from the institutional investors' uh, kind of engagement, and how is it that they are trying to push this uh, pricing through the divestment activity? We do not find actually investors to divest based on their level or changes in emissions. What we find is that more divestment is happening on the emission intensity. And paradoxically, these are exactly the measures that don't have actually any kind of pricing implications, at least in the data that we observe. So let me conclude by saying that uh, climate uh, risk is definitely at the front of the uh, policy debate these days. I think this conference is a great uh, uh, statement to that, uh, the, the great proof to this particular statement. I think this is not really a fad. I think this is the debate we will uh, be holding for a number of years now. I don't think it is going to go away. I think there are challenges how we want to think about this process. Clearly, it's very difficult to capture transition risk and uh, physical risk at the same time as uh, Johannes and uh, Rob were uh, reflecting on before. But uh, I think it is important to realize that we need to take some effort to understand what these costs are if we want to think about implications of this cost uh, going forward. What I think uh, we can learn from some of this evidence, especially on the equity side that I think we are studying here, is that uh, to some extent, the effects that we find in terms of differences of the cost of capital can serve as an alternative to the carbon tax uh, that a lot of people are talking about these days. Of course, from the social welfare perspective, the carbon tax is a very attractive idea, but practicality of this problem is really daunting. I think the coordination cost and reaching any kind of uh, conclusions in this regard is really a little bit of a wishful thinking. So maybe we can leverage financial markets to actually think about this transition from a private sector perspective. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Marcin. That's very interesting. It's it's uh, it's very neat to see empirical evidence that the market actually is responding to these kinds of risks, and that's really what we're talking about. Uh, 